May begin with an opening word of prayer. Dear Father God, creator of the heavens and the earth, God, we come to you right this very instant, God, asking you, God, to be a very present help in this, in this, in this time, that, God, we need to hear from you about Christian leadership, to be better leaders, to develop and grow into that, those persons, those leaders, those models of faith, those models of service that, God, you have called us to be. Father God, we want to bring glory to your name in everything we do. So, God, fill us right now. Talk to us. Speak to us. Uh, direct us. Teach us. Edu educate us. Uh, edify us. Encourage us. Inform us. Whatever you need to do, God, so that we walk out of here better leaders than we were before we came in. Father God, we love you and we thank you. It's in your son's mighty matchless, marvelous, magnificent name that we do pray. Amen. 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 As you know, we are in our study, Emerging Leaders, Discovering the Servant Within to Expose the Leader Without. Amen. And we've using the Henry and Richard Blackaby book, Spiritual Leadership, Moving God onto Moving People onto God's Agenda. Uh, chapter one is called The Leader's Challenge, and we've been looking at the different challenges that leaders have had to encounter as uh, we are trying to engage in this thing called leadership. And the first one, the obvious one, is technology. That technology has made, the, made it both easier and harder to be a leader now. It made it easier because we have a greater influence, a greater reach uh, uh, to people uh, that are uh, seeking leadership, seeking to be led, but however, it also puts all our shortcomings and failures on front street. And if we do something wrong, it's right there on front street. If we, there's something we don't know about leadership, it's right there on front, front street. And so that's a challenge. How do we use technology? Good evening. I mean, good afternoon. How do we use technology in order to lead effectively? The second uh, challenge that we discussed was globalization. That the church used to be an island all to itself. That there was no other uh, entity that had the influence that the church did at one point in time. That has changed with the advent of technology. The church is no longer an island to itself. It's now uh, a, a one spot, one region on a greater, larger piece of land. And on in that land, the church is competing with other uh, 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 entities, other persons, other things for influence, for leadership. Not only that, but the the uh, pool that we draw, that the church used to draw from, is different now. It used to be the neighborhood, and the neighborhood tended to be homogeneous. It means everyone tended to have the same values, same views, same outlook of life. Now, what's happening because of technology? We could be here in Charlotte. Someone could be in Okinawa, Japan. And tuning in to us right now and listening and saying, well, you know what, I, I agree with them on that point, but I don't agree with them at this point. The world is now small. The world is now one community. And any leader that's going to lead has to lead from this perspective that the world is now one leader, one, one, one community. In fact, um, one of the, during our deacon board meeting this, this week, one of the deacons said, you know, Pastor, maybe we shouldn't broadcast the worship service. And I shared with this deacon, I said, you're not aware that all week long, every week, people are, are contacting me saying, I enjoy this part of your worship, sir. I enjoy that part of your worship. That persons that work on Sundays, but otherwise can't get here, even some of our membership is watching service through Facebook that has Facebook and Periscope, watching service and enjoying service because they believe they now have a chance to be part of us. You know, we got a lot of members that are, that are home ridden now. But they got grandchildren, they got children that have taught them, go on Facebook, click on the page, and when you see it, hit that, hit this uh, link, and it will show you what's going on. And so people are uh, contacting me, and not directly me, but through people I know. They're like, my mom, uh, I keep forgetting how many people my mom know, knows by, uh, on, on, on Sunday. She reminds me on Monday, because she'll tell me that such and such called and said they liked this sermon Sunday, uh, uh, this past Sunday. And so uh, what I'm saying is our reach, our community, is no longer this little, small, perfect, unclaimed of people. Our reach goes a long, long way out. Amen. The third thing, the third challenge that 
that leaders are confronted with today is diversity. Okay? Um, never that we were all the same in our makeup. It's just that we didn't hear uh, or, or, or witness people expressing that they're different. Nowadays, the value in a person is not in how similar they are to, to you. The value in a person is how different they are to you. You know, it, it, we, we, we used to be, I'm black and I'm proud. Now it's, I'm black, I'm Indian, I'm half Chinese, I'm this, I'm that. Because people have this idea of wanting to be diverse. They do not want to be the same. And here's the thing, that means we can't assume that a one-size-fits-all uh, model of leadership will work. In fact, one of the hardest things for me to do is try to figure out, create these sermons so that they speak to all of you. Hey, come on in. Hey, good morning. Good afternoon. Good morning. Afternoon. Whichever one it is. Uh, amen. Praise God. Praise God. Um, one, one of the hardest things it is, uh, uh, right now, I'm sorry, when we finish this, i got to go to my office, and I've got an outline of a sermon. But now I've got to go through the sermon and say, okay, how much of this is going to speak to uh, 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 my folks that are millennials? How many is this going to speak to my folks that are Generation S? How many is going to speak to my baby boomers? And what's the group before the, before the baby boomers? What, what was the name of that group? The settlers? I think they were called the settlers. How, many is, how much is going to speak to my settlers? That's your mom. That's your mom and, 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 and Dr. Rimmer's mom. How, how is this? Because, again, I can't assume that I'm preaching just to one group. I have to assume I'm preaching to everyone. And so that means every example I use has to be one that transcends uh, uh, gender, uh, uh, not gender, generational lines, all right? Because just in the, the sanctuary, we've got a diverse group of people. Guess what? I've got women in there and men. And so guess what? Y'all have issues that we men don't have. We men have issues that y'all don't have. So I've got to make sure that the sermon speaks to, to the men and the women in the sanctuary. Guess what? We have children, we have adults, we have grandchildren. We've got to make it so the children that, are, that decide to stay in there can get a word and feel that God is speaking to them as well as their parents and their grandparents. Diversi diversity within the church. There's diversity outside the church. Try this on. Uh, we, we laugh and joke, but it's the truth. How we worship in the black church is not how persons worship in the white church, it's not how persons worship in the Asian church, not how persons worship uh, uh, in, in, in the Latin church. We all have our different styles because we bring our diversity to worship. And to think that we can just say, open up a door and say, hey, come in. Some people don't come because guess what they say? That's not a Latin church. That's not an Asian church. That's not a white church. They don't worship like you do. Make you laugh. I went to pick up TK from, from uh, daycare yesterday. A little woman said, all right, Pastor, what's the sermon about tomorrow, about this weekend? Caught me off guard. I was like, huh? I, I, I forgot that she knew I was a, a pastor. I said, oh, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm explaining the sermon. She said, I like that. And, I, and you know, that I like how you're using Joseph, da, da, da. I said, so am I going to see you? She said, well, no, I'll go to preacher. And, and, and guess what, y'all? We probably don't worship as lively as y'all do, so I don't want to feel out of place. I said, I said that's not, I said, that, that's an assumption. I said, we're going to welcome you just as you are. Come if you want to come. I said, there's no one right way or wrong way to worship God. Just come. But she was afraid that her diversity was different from our diversity, and that she could not find a place. We cannot find a place of similarity. So really, that's the challenge. Out of all this diversity, trying to find some kind of common ground, some similarity that for all people want to uh, uh, participate in. Here's the next one. We talked about this last time. Politics. Whoo! This is that one. That was amen. That 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 was still a hot one today. Let me go ahead and say this to everyone right now. Okay, if you have not voted, today's the last day for early voting. And here's the rules. If you are in line before the close of the polls, you have to be allowed to vote, all right? They cannot come outside if you're outside in the line and say everyone outside has to leave. If you're in line, you have to vote. If you're going to wait to Tuesday, it's Tuesday to vote, not Wednesday. Last two elections, persons have been calling people of color and, uh, and women 
telling, them, telling us that we can vote on Wednesday. It's over on Wednesday. You cannot vote early on Monday, okay? So let me just plug that. But we talked about politics uh, last time we heard that. Politics is an issue now in terms of our leadership. That in politics, in, in this context, that whenever there is a position that has influence or power, people are going to compete for it. How do leaders lead in such a way that we produce new jury leaders that aren't so political? You know, somehow we can be so political that we don't actually serve the purpose that we've been put in a position. I mean, we, we don't have to talk about the election, election, but here it is. Many of us fight so hard to get the position at the job. We, 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 rub, we rub brown nose, rub up, whatever the term is that we use, to get in the position to be put the leader, that once we get there, we fought so hard to become the leader that we didn't realize to take the time to learn what it meant to serve in the capacity, so now we're sitting here scratching our head trying to figure out how do we? That's because politics uh, has entered into the picture. And the truth is there is really no position of any kind of leadership, influence, or power that does not have politics connected with it. There's not. I mean, let's, let, 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 let's be for real. You can be the homeowner uh, association president for your neighborhood. And then you will have some folks that will say, you know what, don't go over there and talk to them people over on, on, on Sally May Street, because you know, they they crazy. And then the ones on Sally May, don't go over there on John Brown Drive, because all they want to do is just have parties and, and tear up the neighborhood. There's always politics. So, you got a question? Oh, you just rub your nose. Oh, okay. All right, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right, I'm looking at, I think that in effective leadership, that at times, Mm -hmm. In order to be able to get what you need and you want for the people you supervise and you need, you may have to be political. That's true. Yes. In order to do that. But I'm talking about the way that you make decisions mm -hmm. is always political. Yeah, cool. And that presents the problem. That did, exactly. Exactly. So, 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 exactly. So let me speak to what you're saying right quick. So, so here's the thing. All right. So uh, we have uh, young people in our congregation that love... Mm -hmm which love the contemporary gospel music. It's what they hear on Praise 100.9 and on Sunday mornings at 101.9. And they want to hear it when they come in. However, we have persons that grew up on hymns. Uh, amen, praise God, amen, uh, amen. There is a God somewhere. <laughs> I'm making sure the doors are locked. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Um, so like there are young people that want to hear the contemporary gospel. I mean, the Kirk Franklin's, the Hezekiah Walkers, the Jonathan Reynolds, uh, 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 in, in those, the, in the, the Mary Marys. But then you have the folks that want to hear, what are they called? Uh, the, uh, it's a group of God, the Travelers or something. But you know what I'm talking about, they sing the old hymns. Yeah, yes, they sing the hymns. And so, uh, so here's the thing. In order to make sure that we're all on one page and can move forward in worship, I have to be political. I have to make sure that we don't all have hymns and we don't all have contemporary songs that we're intermixing the, the hymns. That's what I, that's, that, 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 I think that's an example of having some kind of be political in order to move the agenda forward. However, I agree with you. Persons that keep things, that do, cannot operate in anything but politics, can't operate in anything but you know, you do this, I do this. You scratch my back, I scratch my back. That's a problem because what? Because you're never really exercising leadership. What you're doing, you're exercising the art of negotiation. And you're and you are saying, okay, if you give, I give. If you relinquish, I relinquish. At some point, though, remember, mom and dad. For those of us who have siblings, at some point, mom and dad say, "Be quiet." That ain't the word they really use, but my my daughter fusses at me for saying that as you. U T U P words. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everyone, be quiet. You are all wrong. If mom and daddy had to go through and just start basically whooping everyone, okay? A good leader at some point has to tell everyone to be quiet. Everyone start talking because everyone is got it wrong. And this is why. This is what I'm saying about po this is what this is what we're trying to convey about politics. That we have gotten so political. And guess what? In everything we do, we're scared 
that if we, here's another thing, we're scared that if we take a stance, it offends someone. Guess what? Every time you, you, you make a decision, you, you've made a decision opposite someone else. So, for example, tomorrow when I sport my brand new robe that's done at Pittsburgh Steelers uh, paraphernalia, amen. I know I have offended both Deacon Rembert and Deacon Styles. I'm calling the lockdown. <laughs> uh, amen. But 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 I can't I cannot not make a decision for fear that someone is going to someone's going to be upset. If we really understood politics, what we understand is that a loss a day is a win tomorrow. That here's the thing. The three of us may not agree on football teams today, but come, about, come do something about a ministry outreach event, we may be the three leading voices on it. And so there's no need to be upset today that we pick three different teams to support because tomorrow, at, for our educational outreach activity, we're all on the same page. All right? That brings us, we also dealt with business. Business is also looking. In fact, let me back up for a second. The authors in politics say that we, what us, what political leaders should be trying to become is political statesmen. All right, these are persons that, regardless of their parties or regardless of their group allegiances, chose what was right for everyone. They walked down the middle of the road. And, and we looked at some. We looked at uh, uh, John Clyburn, Thurgood Marshall, uh, uh, Carol Braun Mosley, Cory Booker. These are statesmen that are trying to, in politics, yes, they're Democrats, but they don't always vote straight Democrat. They're voting for what's right, all right? And, and the authors were saying that uh, uh, we should pass a spiritual statement. And so we looked at, uh, we had Martin Luther King, Dr. the Reverend Dr. Martin, he would be a spiritual statement. Uh, we, we had a sister, uh, uh, Mother Teresa, she would have been a spiritual statement, all right? Uh, that's the goal, that what we want to get to be spiritual statement. Business, even business wants leaders that look mm. like, feel like, sound like, taste like, smell like Christians. In fact, try this on. If you read many business books today, they're written by persons that are devout Christians that work in corporate America. Business, the business world has understand, has begun to understand that the win at all costs model is actually destructive. The uh, cut corners, uh, the um, uh, uh, let's close a close a eye to unethical behaviors so that we have large profits, that those days are gone. That that many businesses are looking for leaders that have integrity, that have morals, and that, and that seem to serve a higher sense of purpose. Alright? So for some of us who may be saying to our saying to ourselves right now, uh, I think we can really have someone pull in for a second. Uh, I, I I saw them sawing the pull in. Um, uh, but for, for, for many of us to think that we can come to church and just be church leaders and then go to work and just be work leaders and have a, a bifurcation, a separation of the two, that doesn't exist anymore. In fact, folks are more liable to look at you for promotion if they know that you have a strong spiritual life because they're hoping you can bring that spiritual life onto the job and give the job an injection of integrity and morality and ethics that it doesn't have. Go ahead, bro. Just to piggyback on what you said, I read an article uh -huh. about a month ago to verify what you just said, uh -huh. that corporations are turning more to religious folks of their leaders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's, <coughs> it's not unheard of <coughs> for corporation to, to schedule retreats with their leaderships and then they have a minister or a preacher there teaching them because again business is business <coughs> let's be for real if I have 10 widgets you need 10 widgets uh, all we got to do is negotiate of how to come to a middle ground where you feel the cost you have to pay for the widgets is not taking you for granted I feel that I'm my, my the value of my widgets is not being 
stole, stolen from you. That's never going to change. However, the practice of business is what's changing. All right. The uh, uh, the w how we walk out our, our 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 business practices, how we walk out our business dealing. Do we, if we shake and say, okay, ten widgets, ten dollars today. Are you going to come back to me on Wednesday and say, well, you know what, I changed my mind. It's twenty dollars for ten widgets. That's what they're looking for. Or better yet, you know what the biggest problem is? Is how leaders are treating their underlings. I'll give you an example. Uh, young lady I know, uh, friends with me, was telling me that her supervisor does not motivate her to accomplish her professional goals. I said, what do you mean? She said, she doesn't. She doesn't do anything. I said, as you know, she said, no. So we were talking, come to find out the leader that was put over this department is younger than anyone that works in departments, has less experience than anyone that works in the department. When, I was, when she was telling me, I said, you know what, this leader got a position because of internal politics. She, you know, she is connected to someone. And, and so the, the problem is she feels intimidated because you have all these people who got 15, 20, 25, 30 years and doing this particular field, she has less than five. And so she doesn't feel that she can and she can influence and believe them. And, and, um, and so, basically, what she's done, she's taking a very demeaning stance toward the employees, treating them as, you know, I'm, I'm the leader and whatnot. Well, guess what? I told my friend, I said, you know, she ain't gonna be there long. I said, because the trend in business is finding leaders that lead like Jesus. And do you ever see Jesus demean his followers? No. I said, so guess what? I said, just like you talking to me right now, there are persons, other persons in your department who are talking to. This person's <laughs> tenure as being your leader is coming to us uh, an end real soon. All right? Now, having said all that, that brings us to today. The issues, leadership in church. Okay? There is such an enormous vacuum of genuine leadership in church that would-be saviors always find a ready market of followers looking for someone to enhance the quality of their lives. This is a truth. There is a vacuum. There is a void of quality, sound leadership within the church that persons are jumping to, flocking to anyone and everyone uh, that looks like they have the answers to make life better. In fact, haven't you... See, I ain't going to mention no names, but have you seen leaders, you listen to them, and you say, that, that can't possibly be working, because life has taught you that it ain't that easy. If it was easy as getting up one morning and saying, in the name of Jesus, I declare I have this, wouldn't we all have what we have? You know, if it was easy, if, if defeating the devil was easy as walking up to him and saying, you are defeated, get out of here, and he runs from you. What trouble will we ever have? If simply, like, if simply with being able to walk up and lay hands on someone, cured everyone, the insulator, who would be sick? But you know what? We live in a we live in a time and age where medicine doesn't work, where uh, promises have failed, where uh, uh, the the jump up and down ten times, copy hand five, the, the, the rituals that people are telling us to do don't work. And so what happens, we feel as if God is not able, God can't do. And so what happens, we sit here and we pray, God, please send us a Savior. We've got a Savior. His name is Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ. But we want another Savior that comes and immediately takes, take, moves us out of where we were to where we want to be. And then we wonder why we see things that happen like in Waco, Texas. I know we all remember Jim Jones, right? Oh, yeah. With the great Kool-Aid, right? And we all said, man, I don't see how that could ever happen again. And then here came Waco. Waco. We said, we don't know how Waco could happen again. Two years ago, remember the guys on the federal property that were killing people? That, that, that the marshals, the total yeah. marshals that we'll get off of? <coughs> They were saviors of someone. They had followers. They're with them. They weren't there alone. And so knowing this, what we what the issue becomes is lack of effective spiritual leadership. Now let me say this, okay? 
And I don't want anyone to come back and say, Pastor, they're all leaders. Yes, they are leaders. But not every leader is effective. Okay? But Deacon, uh, remember, if, we, if I can use this example, there are football teams, but not every football team is a good football team. I mean, I can I, one. Amen. Amen. One of them ain't been <laughs> past the first round of the football playoffs in 25 years. Amen. I ain't going to look at no one, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Amen. I don't know what a championship looks like. Amen. But they are, they are a football team. And then there are championship teams, all right? <coughs> I'm making this engine here. There are church leaders, but what we're looking for are effective church leaders. Leaders that not only are able to <coughs> convey a vision, but get people onto the same page to move the vision forward, all right? Um, here's a problem. This is one reason why we lack effective spiritual leadership. Church leaders are regularly being exposed to immorality, unethical conduct. Let me say this to you right now. Whatever your proclivity is, get it in check. Yes, sir. Get it in check. Because if you're not careful, God's going to expose you. Hey, all of us, all of us. The Catholic Church is a good, good example. For years, the Catholic Church wanted to ignore the endosyncrasies of human sexuality. They wanted to act like sex was a beast that you could lock away in a cage and be forever locked away. And what happened, what we are realizing, we are seeing, that sex is a monster that is hard to control. And that when you try to lock it out of going in this way, when they say you cannot get married, it turned another way. And it, and it made them sexual predators of the young boys that were there. Many of the priests that are doing this, have, this is what they've been, been done to them. And it's been going on so long that guess what? They think this is normal. I mean, I mean my, my question is this. You got Catholic priests and you got Catholic nuns. Why don't you let the two of them get married? They both serve the same purpose. They're on the same rules. Why don't you let them get married? You know? Uh, and, 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 in fact, there are some dioceses and there are some bishops here in, in, in America that are bucking that trend. All right? I went to perform a wedding ceremony in, in Tennessee. And uh, the couple had asked me to marry them because when I first met them, I met them through my wife. And I said, ooh, God, y'all are so in love, y'all get married. They looked at each other like, we can barely stand each other. But a few years later, they, they got married. So they're like, you know, since you're the one who the first said we want you to marry. So the, the, the bride's mother like, no, you're Catholic. You got to have a Catholic wedding. So what they decided to do, they were going to do a Catholic wedding on the Friday and do my wedding on the Saturday. And so while we're at the wedding, uh, the, the, the groom is nervous, like most grooms are. And so he says, take her hand. So he took her hand. He said, repeat after me. And so he turned to go to the, 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 the priest. So the priest is giving the vow. He said, oh, look at her. And, say, and so he said, oh, he said, hey, dude, hey, dude, I'm married. So my, so my wife, no, you know how wives do. You're trying to play, y'all can't play poker at all. This, who? did you hear that? And I was like, would you be quiet? And, and, so, and so afterwards, uh, you know, he, 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 the preacher, the, the priest came and said, you know, I'm so happy to meet you. I understand you're going to do the ceremony tomorrow. Me and my wife will come. I said, your wife? He said, yeah. He said, now all of us live by that oath of not having wives. He said, and my bishop over the diocese lets us have wives if we want to. So even within that, in that situation, there's a realization that, you know what, you cannot beat out human nature. All right? Here's another one that is being exposed time and time again, okay? Preachers are pastors' motivations for leading, all right? Locally, we've seen two. Their unmanaged, unbridled desire for more and more economic wealth got them in trouble, okay? Um, I say it all the time, there's a church that had it picked me, you wouldn't have had me as your pastor. 
three, now it's been six years ago. Um, at the time, they would call me up to Pittsburgh to come preach you know, every other week. And so they decided to go to another preacher. That pastor is now, has now been indicted in the federal court, just like the two down here, because he has literally embezzled <clears throat> every bit of their money. And I, I want to tell you, uh, um, whatever your proclivities are, it will show if you don't get it under control. Go ahead, Doc. I think that's why, I don't, I don't think, I know that's why First Fellowship put into place processes to keep ministers, wherever they might be, to come here mm -hmm. to keep you away from the money. Thank you. Don't, you don't need to sign up checks, you don't need to request anything. Amen. Because if the federal government comes, you say, look, I don't deal with money. Right, right. And here's the thing, as, as a lawyer, it's easier to defend an organization because there's so many layers in the organization, if there's a tax issue, mm -hmm. then to defend one person whose name is on everything mm -hmm. and is signing things. And in fact, if both of them had gone to their churches, then there would never have been a case. In fact, what it would have been would have been paying back taxes and penalties because you cannot prosecute the organization like that because you cannot show who had the intent. Uh, but, but in those cases, like in Pittsburgh and here, because there was one person mm -hmm. that they could track it all back to, that was a problem. And so I said, thank you. But, it, but, but here's the thing. That also protects you because, I mean, it ain't going to be me, so let's, so let's assume I died this afternoon and you have to get another pastor. He comes in and he's like, well, you need to get me and my wife new benzes. Well, guess what? You have a process in place that will stop that. You know? Well, if you don't have strong leaders within the church. That's true. It still can happen. It can. It can. It because, can. You know, ministers will get their picks. Uh -huh. And they can pick people that they can manipulate, manipulate. Uh -huh. and get what they want. That's the politics. That's, that's part politics. of the politics. Mm -hmm. that's, that's why I'm glad you're here, because I should do like manipulating. <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. It is. That is part of politics. But that's, that's, that's dirty politics. That's dirty politics, because remember, every leader, and this is my belief, in fact, I'm working on a book about this right now, every leader that calls themselves a Christian leader should be modeling themselves after Jesus. That's the model. Not Paul, not Peter, not Moses. Jesus. Because Jesus set a standard. Guess what? Jesus was both accountable and held people accountable, both compassionate and his accountability. Jesus understood that not everyone could do what he did, but still pushed them to try the best they could to do it. Jesus had no problem saying, this is what gets me with a lot of leaders, saying, yeah, I made that decision. So if you got a problem with what they're doing, I'm, I was just doing this Thursday night, sitting in my office, writing about the scripture where the where the Pharisees are getting upset with Jesus because his no getting upset with his disciples because his, his, they pit ears of corn as they're walking through the field. And Jesus says, so Jesus first takes them back to scripture. What did David and his men do when they were in the temple? They the show bread, the consecrated bread. He said, and he was trying to show them. That the the it wasn't about the ritual; it was about the about the purpose God was serving. And then He tells them, "I let them pick the the, the corns of ears, ears of corns, not corns of ears, ears of corns, and, and, and ear ears of corn." So He's taking responsibility. And said, "You gonna look at someone? Excuse me, look at me. Blame me. We got leaders that won't do that. Won't do that at all. In fact, this week I had to share with a client." I'm sorry, I can't represent you. I am so busy here at the church. My responsibilities at the church are such that I just cannot represent you in what you need me to represent you for. I thought the person, here comes Deacon uh, Jones. Uh, I saw attorney. I saw, I thought the person would go off and say, hey, that's all right, we want to do this, we want to do that. The person emailed me back and said, you know what, thank you for your honesty. I read that you have been honest with me and tell me that you can't help me then to hold my case to a point that I can't do anything 
and then I'm stuck. I mean, I know that probably wasn't what they wanted to hear because I was highly recommended to them, them to me. But just being honest, you know, uh, just being honest is a hard thing for many of our church leaders. Yet here we are, we're supposed to be followers of Christ. If there's anyone that was brutally honest, it was Christ Jesus. Uh, again, while the church has answers to the most pressing questions people are asking, society views the church with increasingly skeptical eyes. You and I know this is true. Okay? Um, there are persons that we're connected to that have experienced issues in the past of the church that will not walk in church today. You have shared with them, we've got a new pastor, we're doing new things, and they still won't come in. There are some past members I run into all the time that I've seen their names and I put faces with their name, and I sit to them all the time and say, when are you coming? Pastor, I'm coming, I'm coming. I'm looking at them like you just lying to me. I can't, I can't discern that you're lying to me, you're not coming. But I keep pressing them, when are you coming? In fact, one person said to me, I'm not sure that I'm a member anymore. I said, so at what point did you send in your letter resigning your membership to the church clerk? <laughs> they said, uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't really send my letter in yet. I said, oh, okay. I said, so, and so what church conference did you show up while we're having conferences? I said, I, will, I make a motion that you take me off the membership rolls. They said, well, Pastor, you know, I ain't never been there to do that. I said, so you're still a member. I said, maybe not a member of good standing because we haven't seen you, but you're still a member. Why don't you come back and participate? And they're like, ah, I've had some issues with the church. Okay, you've had some issues with the church. Who hasn't? After my Facebook page, I posted this page that said, if there's, it was a men that said, if there's anyone that's been hurt by the church, it was Jesus. Yet he still came back the next day. So, people are looking at us skeptically. All right, And I think that we can ask skeptically because our leaders, the leadership, has not done a good job of being leaders. And so what happens, we, we now, because we haven't been, a good job, been good at it in the past, those of us today are fighting hard just to get people to come into church. And it's a struggle, y'all. I can't, can't begin to tell you. Uh, it is a struggle trying to fight with people. In fact, Deacon Styles will make you verify this. After you left, you walk in, I could hear the voices, but I thought, you know how Wayne carried the voices? I thought they were coming from the apartments over there. Two guys talking. I turn around when she gets in my car, I can see them. They are talking, looking at <laughs> the tenant windows of my sanctuary. One turns and looks at me, and they turn back. So I walk up to him. I said, hello, my name Pastor Al. What's your name? He says, well, I can't tell you. I don't tell people my name. I said, excuse me? He said, he said I don't tell him. So I, call, I stopped the other one. I grabbed because he didn't want to shoot me. I grabbed the other one. I held him there. I said, well, you're not going to tell you? He said, no. I said, so let me get this straight. If I was getting ready to bless you with a million dollars, you wouldn't tell me what your name is? He said, no. I said, if I will give you a job, you know, I, with all these things, I think they will like to know. I said, that's something. And so, you know, Deacon South says, some people just like that. Yes, they are. I wonder if some of that, Deacon Styles, was skepticism based on past experience. I, part of me believes they were up to no good, peeking in there. And what happened, I guess I was not supposed to see two Latin guys peeking <laughs> in the window. In broad daylight, you know, so I guess I wasn't. But part of me also says, some of that is skepticism, too. Some of that is skepticism. Because guess what? I'm sure that they have done things before, and the first thing leaders have done is say, stay right here. Where's my phone? 911, I got two little young men you need to come pick up. And they were probably afraid I was about to send them to jail. That's why. You know what? You saying that, that gave me um, a week ago. A week ago at work, we're not supposed to have outside children walking around the mm -hmm. campus. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were two boys out there, and I went out and I said, why are you out here? You're not supposed to be out here. I said, what's your name? The boy said, I can't tell you that. 
I said, you can't tell me your name. I said, what school you go? I can't tell you that either. I said, okay. So I went in to get my phone so I could take a picture of him. He uh, took off running. Because uh, I told him, I said, I'm supposed to call a resource officer mm -hmm. whenever we have children mm -hmm. running around the school. Mm -hmm. And they look like, because during the weekends, the school was broken into. Right, so, right. you know, I said, right. they probably have done something mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, they are. And because of that, because you got to remember, it's past experience with leaders that make people skeptical of coming in. So they probably had a leader that did that. Because some other leader probably didn't go outside, just called a resource officer. And had, had him chase him around. Uh, but we, uh, in fact, let me get to this point. Churches are requiring leaders that can not only have overcome challenges, but can also attract new members of scared and resources to finance an increasingly expensive organization. Is this true? Every church wants a leader. In fact, this was, we discussed this during my interview. If you had, how would you deal with a challenge that came up, an issue between members, an issue at the church? That was a, these were the questions I asked. Then it was, how do you attract, how would you, how do you plan to attract new members? You know, uh, and th these are questions. These are verifiable. Every church has this question, these questions. This is the challenge. In other words, I, I call it the Jesus desire. Everyone wants a Jesus leader that can come in and do the, the miraculous, that can overcome the issues that are presently there, bring in new, new members, and bring in new financial resources, new money. Um, the problem we have that, every, that we all are facing, we all, because all of us in here are leaders, okay, is religious consumerism. If you notice in the picture, what do you see in this picture? If you can see it. A lot of churches. A lot of churches. churches. On, on one oh. corner, there are four different churches. churches. Huh? Five. Six. And I think the way the picture got cut off, seven. Seven churches on one block. Which means all of them are competing <clears throat> for the, sadly, the same people. Okay? One thing you've heard me say is there are 225,000 people waiting for us to capture. All right? The truth is, there are more than that. When I did my, when I was writing my dissertation, one of the chapters in my dissertation had to be on the context of ministry. And it wasn't just the church, but it was the locale that the ministers were listed in. So this is what I learned. In the greater, in the Charlotte city limits, are anywhere between 970 to 985,000 members uh, given the year, because it fluctuates, it goes up and down. So that's the range. In the greater Charlotte area, that's Mecklenburg, Union, Gaston, Cabarrus, the counties that butt up against Mecklenburg, even Lancaster, South Carolina. We have 2.7 million people living in the area. So you have almost a million people living in the city. Another 1.7 million living around the area, okay? Surprisingly, 10% of that goes to church. So if we're in the city, that's about 98,000 members. And that persons go to church. If we're in the greater Charlotte area, that's 107,000. That leaves 90% of the people here living in the city that do not attend church. Yet, you know what happens? We fight over everyone's members. We fight over, you know what, greater Salem having a problem. And so their members are starting to spread. You go out there, you tell them, and get, get as many men as you can. And I know people are upset at University Park because they've gone to the video screens and he ain't there all the time. You go in there, anyone who said they upset, get them here to come to church. And the problem is, we ain't bringing new sheep into the, into the, into the barn. We're just a changing sheep that's already there. Now, if you can imagine a barn with sheep pens, we're just taking sheep from one sheep pen and putting in another sheep pen. Where there are all these people that are out here 
2.7 million people minus 100, uh, I'm sorry, 200, 207,000, what, whatever that is, that's, that's 2 point something, let's say, uh, I'm not good at math, so let's say 2.4, that's 2.4 million people that don't know Christ, yet we are competing Sunday after Sunday over the ones that already know. We should really, really be making a very big effort to get those who aren't here. Uh, uh, I, I was reading, and I, I agree with the authors, when they say, in our consumer-oriented society, companies inundate us with every manner of promise and incentive. Don't believe me, turn on turn, tomorrow, today and tomorrow, don't the games, watch the games. Not for the game, watch the commercials that you see come in there. In fact, I saw a commercial Thursday night watching, where it was basically telling men that society has us not being men anymore. So the image was a guy in a, in a car, the old-fashioned bathtub, taking a bath with the woman products, and another guy crocheting. The whole, it, it was trying to, that commercial has been on and on and on and been inundated us with, if you want to be a man, get this product. And the other thing, other companies are doing the same thing. During the Watch football games, you see a lot of men-oriented commercials. Men go here to eat. Men do this. Men drive this. Men, cause these companies are inundating us, trying to tell us that if we are going to be real men, that we use their products. Ladies, the blitz is on. It's, it's now November. The Christmas commercials are coming, and they are going to inundate you with, if you want to love your family, if you want to have a great Christmas holiday, you need our products. That's how churches are functioning, too. Churches are competing with everyone and with one another for allegiance and spending enormous energy and resources to attract both believers and non-believers. Churches, I hate to say it, um, on Sunday mornings I hear it on 101.9, <clears throat> the preacher, this is a commercial he runs, Reverend such and such, you know, are you experiencing voodoo spells? Do you have a loved one that no one loves you? Are you, are you not succeeding on the job? Call Reverend such and such. Reverend such and such can pray for you and, and lead you and do all of this. And if you call Reverend such and such, he will see you now for a limited time, a free bottle of anointed oil. That is the, are you sick and tired of your food sticking to your pan? Why don't you try the new copperware? It is designed with the same kind of metal that's on the space shuttle so that your food would never stick. And if you hurry now, we'll throw in not one, but two. And then we'll put in the bowling pot. That's the same formula that's being used. That, and he's not the only one. Other churches are doing the same thing. We are acting as if you are a consumer. Here's the thing. God didn't call us to create consumers. He called us to create witnesses. Matthew 28. Therefore go you out into the world, baptizing all persons in my name, in my name, and teaching them what I taught you. <clears throat> you know the problem we have? Many, many people come to church to be entertained because entertainment is a, is a product of consumerism. We live in, a, in society. Go as entertainment. Make billions of dollars. Entertainment. So then we come to church special the same thing. We want the songs we want to hear. We want the prayers we want to pray. And we want a, we want a sermon that anesthetizes us. You know what anesthetizing is? It's the administering of an anesthesia so you don't feel the pain anymore. But anytime we get, anytime it doesn't go like that. Anytime that we get a, a service, a word, or a church that's pushing you to do to really do an introspective examination of yourself, to do an analysis of who you are in regard to God and your neighbor, we get up and leave. And it ain't just here. When I was at another church, two churches, as soon as the pastor said amen on the sermon, persons got up and started walking out. You know why? They didn't want to be caught in the traffic leaving church. They didn't mind the traffic getting into church. They didn't want to call traffic leaving church. They wanted to go spend the rest of the day. And here's the thing. What they didn't understand, they were walking out without a benediction put on their life. I heard that. If you leave out after service and you don't hear the 
benediction, your cut is short. Of your, of, I've heard that. Of your blessing, of your protection. Mm -hmm. Because if you if you pay attention to benediction, what's one of the things you hear me say? Please, Lord God, keep and bless us during that Sunday so we return back to your house. Now that doesn't mean God can't do it with anyway, but don't you want to walk out here with some certainty? That, that you've heard a prayer praying over you, that God keep you, that God watch over you? Again, I said I said almost every single Sunday during the, the invitation. Tomorrow is not promised. I, I remember my father when I was in high school, because was he my age in high school? Yeah, he was my age. No, he's a little older. He's a little older. But I remember riding the car and he was clearly he was upset about something. I said, Dale, what's wrong? He said, I'm at the age now where life is starting to take friends rather than give friends. And what happened, he had just gone to uh, uh, one of his classmates' funerals. And, uh, and what, what, what bothered him was at the funeral, one of the people that gave a, a, a remark said, this person's plan had always been to do X, Y, and Z. And he was like, maybe a year short of doing it. And he died. And so that really bothered my father. My father was like, here, I'm planning to do all this, and then I could die tomorrow. And so uh, he, uh, he changed his mind. He, he started doing that. Um, but the, I, I share that with you to say, it's not promised tomorrow. It's not promised tomorrow. Yet we treat the church as if the church is a Walmart or a Target where we can come into it any time we want to get what we want and walk away. Remember the person I asked about Monday night? Had they honored their responsibility? Mm -hmm. That's how we treat companies. We come take their products, and if we're not happy with their service or their product, we stop paying for it. And we don't want, we, hey, they send us a clutch notice is all they want to, we just tear them up, put them right in the trash. Because we're consumers. We are consumers. Uh, so the result of us competing for consumers is that, that there's a smorgasbord board of congregations offering something to satisfy every palate. Every palate. Think of this. If we had done everything we were supposed to do and we were feeding people, would they leave you? I mean, come on. We have some family, we have family members that will not leave no matter how hard we try because we have just made it so wonderful and easy at the house for them to be there that they'll stay. Same thing person would have left. Amen. Um, if our current, and here's the thing, again, they often say, if our current places of worship have offended, neglected, or bored us, a new and better religious experience is just down the street on our next corner. You know, you know what wears me out is uh, persons leaving us. So let me talk, I'm using us as a euphemism now, all right? And they're flocking to these new churches that aren't in our neighborhood, that don't service us, that make no, no effort to help us because they think they're getting a better and a newer worship service down there. You're getting a different one but it's still worship, okay? And, and, I, and I don't just mean that one, because there's, a, there's a several other ones that have been here as long as not longer. And when I talk to people, they're like, no, I, 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 I like there because they give me, feed me, give me what I need. I'm like, so none of us could give you what you need. Well, I, you know, I always grew up in something, 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 tabernacle on the side of the road, Baptist a me, Methodist, Presbyterian Church. Okay, well, if that one didn't get you, why don't you go to another one? Why don't you just leapfrog all of us to go over there to get, to get what you need? And what happened is this idea that I've been offended because someone challenged me. I have uh, 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 been neglected, passing and call me, or I'm just bored. And so I want to go down to the place where they have... Uh, uh, they've got a, a live grunge band and a, and a mosh pit and, and other things where, where they've got the club going on inside the church. 
Because uh, uh, again, I'm a consumer. Uh, amen. Here's another thing. We have opposition. The days when the Christian church was a preeminent institution in American society are gone. You know, there used to be a time when, um, uh, uh, um, uh, in fact, let me say this. Ironically, American society now values political correctness above all else by habitually ridiculing and flagrantly discriminating against the Christian church. There used to be a time when something wrong, person would come right here. As busy as I am, I think the pastors of yesterday were even more busy because no one you didn't no one else went anywhere. You went right to the church. Husband and wife having problems? Go see pastor. Mom and dad have been trying to work with this wayward kid that just ain't getting it? Go see pastor. Pastor, we got a family member that's that's dealing with some, some mental health issues, go see pastor. Pastor, we we lost mama, we lost daddy. Go see. church got you. Pastor doctor said that my rheumatism, my arthritis is acting up. Go see, go see, go to the church. Not anymore. Not anymore. We have competition, y'all. Go ahead, love. Um, um, I guess I'm, it's stuck in my mind of all the things you're saying. The question, why? Why, why, why are we not the church that's, that's attracting people? And when I think about consumerism, people, um, we, when, we, when we buy something now, we take the time mm -hmm. to investigate, to, to look at consumer reports and to see which product mm -hmm. is best. Or there's some people who may just go buy one thing, buy it cheaply and come back and then mm -hmm. have to pay for it again next time. But the question for me is, why are we not the church? You talked about mm -hmm. the, the barns are the same, we just switch in sheep. Right. Why not change the barn? So that when the sheep get there, they will have the kind of experience that, that, that they want to have. But let me just let me go, ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I, I was at the polls today, and mm -hmm. there was a young woman there voting. There was a candidate who bought his card, his palm card up to her and said, my name is, I am running for, I would like for you to vote for me. Mm -hmm. And she looked at him, and she says, um, and there were three young ladies together. And she said, well, if I vote for you, we're going to expect. <laughs> she, the word, she looked and she said, we are, she said, I'm going to expect that you will do what is what, what you need to do. She said, that's, our, that's my expectation. And so I'm thinking that the church, and, and he was taken aback, by the way, when, when, when she said that, that we, we expect that you will do something. Part of the political stuff is mm -hmm. that people get elected mm -hmm. and, they, and they work hard at staying elected. Yes. And not necessarily... Um, <laughs> talking about the needs of the people. And I'm, I'm saying that the churches sometimes do that. They mm -hmm. work real hard at being the building that you showed in that picture, mm -hmm. of, of keeping the lawns mowed and mm -hmm. everything, mm -hmm. but they're not, they're not meeting the expectations of the people. And, and I'm thinking, like, what is it that we are going to have to do and become in order to attract? We're not going to be able to attract everyone because of those many different religions. Right, right. But, but in spite of the fact that there should be a separation of church and state, we know that that's not really... No, that's a big slide. That's a big slide. That, that, that doesn't happen. But my question is, is why what? or what is it that we have to do in order to be that church that consumers will want to buy and that the young people will want to buy and that those of us who are more seasoned will want to stay with and understand? And here's your answer. We have to become servant leaders. Get outside of life. Yeah. In, in, in fact, let me make you laugh. One day, I was in in my car, and y'all know I I do a green one. So I was in my car, and I was going to pick up a family because the son, I think, yeah, the son had a medical appointment. And so really I was going to pick up the, the, the mother of the son. The, the, the father was at work, okay? They have no car. They have no way to get there. They are depending on government and other persons to help them survive. And so another pastor called me. So he said, hey man, what you doing? I said, well, I'm going to pick up such and such, take them to the doctor and everything. I was calling you. He said, why? I said, because 
I'm their pastor. He said, well, I was calling you for lunch. Go to lunch. I said, well, I can't go to lunch today. I have to pick them up. He was like, what kind of pastor is this that you picking folks up? I said, the one that Jesus called me to. And he was like, pastors don't do that. And I said, and then we wonder why folks aren't li liable to trust us. He said, what do you mean, man? I said, they hear us on Sunday morning telling us, telling us telling them to get right with God. They hear us on Sunday morning browbeating them for a tithe and offering. They hear a Sunday morning of a sermon <clears throat> telling them how they haven't done anything right. And then when they need something, they don't hear us saying, here. Okay? Here, let me help you. That was echoed later because when we were at Epiphany, a young lady with her daughter, she wanted to be a teacher. She had gone to school but had dropped out of school because of the, the requirements of being a mom. She was a single parent. So what we did, we found uh, a program for her. We mean me. Found a program for her. And so she didn't have the electronics capability to look. You could only do this online. So what I did, I picked her up. We went to uh, not Dunkin' Donuts. But um, it's on Central Avenue. We went on, there's a place, it was a coffee, another coffee shop, had free Wi-Fi. So we sat down, took, we took about four hours, we went through the program, we got her there, uh, we ordered her transcripts and whatnot, so that she needed the program, filled everything out. Uh, called, that week I called the school, find, kind of find out one of their persons, and not in admission, but one of their assistant deans, used to be on the choir with me in friendship. And so I was able to call this person and say, hey, I, I need a big favor for you. I remember. And so she walked us through. She actually became, became our voice on staff to do that. And so we got her in, got her scholarship, got her working. She earned her, her, her undergrad degree right when she was working her master. She dated this guy who was the son of a pastor. His mom is a pastor. And so he heard our meeting because we were reviewing I was helping her, and we were reviewing where she was and what she needed to do in regards to her master, because she needed to, she was going to have to write a thesis, so she needed a thesis board, like you did, like a defense board, like you do in a doctorate. So I agreed to be on that. So we're in a meeting. I'm not sure if it was his jealousy or just simple the fact that that's not what he was used to. He said, my mom's a pastor, and my mom has been a pastor for 40 years. She ain't never going to visit no one. She ain't never helped no one like this. And what happened he came at her in such a way that she called me and said, Pastor, I don't know if I can take your help anymore. I said, why? Because my boyfriend doesn't think that it's right for you to be helping me like this. I said, are you serious? She said, yes. She did not complete her master's. She ended up losing the job. Now, I'm not saying that this is because of me, but I think things happen in, 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 because she lost the direction. And things started happening. In fact, at one point, things were so bad, I just happened to see her posting on Facebook. When I reached out to her, she said, well, I need real help. Not, I said, well, you had real help. You chose to follow someone. In fact, there's, there's a proverb. Those who seek the counsel of wise men will be wise, but those who keep the company of foolish men will end up being fools. You chose a foolish person to listen to. And I say that to say that, believe it or not, more leaders are not being servant <clears throat> leaders. They're just being leaders. They, they're looking for, okay, to me, uh, they're looking for under shepherds to do their part. Right. They don't feel like they are, they, even though they're a leader, they out there giving the word, but they don't think that it, they it, should it, go it, and it, do, do that. Right. Under shepherds. Right. Come and see your mama. I, I know two pastors would not come to see your mama if they were her members, if they were her pastors. Would not come to see her. They would send a staff member. Because like you said, they believe that they're supposed to be up there cast vision. Now let me, let me also put this in proper context, okay? 
if you have 30,000 members, it's impossible to see everyone. But you should make an effort to try to see as many as you can. So I don't have a problem with someone who says, I need a team to help me. And so we will share the responsibility. So we will rotate. And you take this one and I'll make my ways around. But I need you to go be there for me first. Versus I'm not going at all. I, I have made it again. My motto is Jesus. When did we ever see Jesus not go to see him someone? And try, in fact, the only time you saw Jesus not go to see someone is because a person requesting help told him don't come. It was a Roman centurion. centurion. He said, no, you don't have to come. I'm a man of authority too. If I tell my officers to do something, they do it. So I expect that if you say it, it's going to be done. But other than that, Jesus went anywhere. Even went to his enemy's house. Jairus was a Pharisee. A synagogue leader. There was never not a time that he didn't go and be and, and, and be a servant. That's why. And that's why I don't get like um, members that are members and then when something happens, you know, they leave the church and then the ones that they forsake, the ones that go and see them and talk to them, mm -hmm. they've been out there mm -hmm. uh, saying negative things mm -hmm. about them, you, you pop up and they're like, you know, mm -hmm. they, I wonder how that person feel. Mm -hmm. You know, after they don't say some negative mm -hmm. stuff about mm -hmm. then who they left, they come up. Let me tell you, that is almost the, the way of the world. Mm -hmm. Folks will talk trash about you. Folks will be your greatest enemy to what happens when you need them. And then when you show up in spite of them, they are actually flabbergasted. They, are, they don't even know what to say. They don't even know what to do. But what do you say to people, you know, even though they've gone out and scandalized your name, and then you run into somebody and they say, well, I hear you, your church, so and so does. What do you say to that person? You, you, you know what you do? You don't, you don't, don't respond. You don't entertain them where they are. Right. Okay? You entertain them where God is. So here's the thing. So, like, 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 okay, this, this is a real life example. I ran into someone who is a church leader here. They didn't know I knew who they were. And so when they met me, I could see them putting two and two together of who I am. And so they began to, like you said, talk bad about us. Mm -hmm. So my response could have been, wait a second, you ain't going to talk about my church. Listen here, Negro. I will knuckle up and take you to the ground for talking bad about these are my people, these are my sh sheep. You didn't want to be part of them, so close your mouth. You know how we get, just start getting loud. But then I thought about it. People watching us, what would they have seen? They would have seen the leader reduce himself down to that person's level. They would see me acting like the world. And they would say, "What? why come there if they are going to be just like the world, I might as well say in the world. And so he, when the person finished talking, I'm trying not even to use uh, pronouns so you, can, so you don't figure out who this is. When the person finished talking, I said to this person, I said, last time I checked, you still hold a leadership position with this church. You have not relinquished it. You have not surrendered it. I expect you, because we're going to have an event, to be here at this event on this day ready to serve, ready to go, because that is your Christian obligation. Now, if you do not want to hold that title anymore, I will right now take a written, handwritten letter from you saying you relinquish it, and I will make sure that it gets to the appropriate people to do that. But what I'm expecting as your pastor is for you to be here. I said, now, don't worry. No one's going to say, I'm not going to let anyone say anything to you about you not being here. I'm not going to let anyone say anything to you about some of the things you've been saying. But you show up. That's how you deal with it. Because guess what? I, I, I'm the pastor. That's, ain't that what I'm supposed to do if you aren't doing your job? And I'm supposed to remind you that you aren't doing your job. So I told this individual that. Now, of course, this individual did not show up. But here's also the thing. For the same people that I know that he knows, he hasn't said no. They haven't said anything else. <clears throat> so, I, I, so there's two questions happening here. That's how you handle it. The reason is because.
because leaders are not being servant leaders. Okay. And yeah. perhaps they are not teaching the membership to be servant. Right. So that's another thing. I try to, I have learned that I can teach you. I can give you the information. Thank you. You have to practice it. Okay. You have to practice it. And you have to, I can't, I, can't, so I know folks like, Pastor does everything. But guess I'm trying to do everything. Sometimes I'm doing everything so you can see it's done. It's done. Because I cannot tell you how many times I'm doing something and someone says to me, Pastor, we can't do that. We've never done that before. It can't happen. So sometimes some of the things I'm doing is to show you, yes, it can be done if you would just do it. So many times in being a leader, again, what did Jesus do? Jesus said, all right, feed the people. You don't have enough. How much do you have? Five loaves and two fish. Give it to me. He, gave, he, gave, he showed them how to feed. Pray, break, or divide, give. That's the model. Pray, divide, give. Pray, divide, give. Pray, divide, give. Let me show you, tell you how that worked. Our first food giveaway. I looked in that closet because we, we came and cleaned it out, okay? Uh, we, we spent a Wednesday, an oh, entire day cleaning it out. And we threw away so much food that I got so concerned that we weren't going to have enough. And it just so happened I looked at that scripture, pray, divide, give. So I prayed over it. When I broke open some of those packets of food and divided them, it gave us 45, 44, 45 boxes. I was shocked. I didn't think we were going to have that much. Pray, divide, and then we gave. Here's a, here's a wonderful thing, the beautiful thing. The board of directors contacted me that Saturday morning and said, the board of directors voted that we want to put together uh, packages, food packages, for persons of homeless. That they don't have to warm it up. They can just eat it. And what happened when we went out there? We just stayed... We took, we took his grandchildren with the idea of letting them see it. It happened so fast that they were, I don't know if they saw it, because as soon as we stepped off the bus, they ran to us. Right. And, and the fact, the funny thing is, we can see the people all, we didn't realize there were a whole other people in the woods behind us. They came out of everywhere. In two minutes, we went through all that stuff. But again, I, the whole idea is to show us I don't ever want you to say, you know, Pastor Alvin, one of the kind of leaders, he good at telling me what to do, but he don't do it himself. I say it all the time. I'm not going to ever ask you to do something I'm not willing to do myself. I'm not going to ask you to help me work on the roof, and I ain't up there working on it with you, too. I mean, I mean that's, but, but that's, 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 that's a great example of, of, of kind of a teaching moment for, for us, for like the praying, the dividing, and then sharing, and then giving it. And that's, that to me is like how, a concrete example of how you teach people to be servants. Amen. And, 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 and understand that. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So Amen. And so I, 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 I'm, I'm saying that to say uh, that's what we have to do. Because you're right. Because this brings us right back here. Because folks ain't serving, and I know that's bad, language, we, we, but it, the truth, and so we get it, we ain't being servant leaders, we're giving people the right to discriminate against us, to be disrespectful to us. One of the biggest complaints I hear, I'm talking to people out there, wait a second, I, I, every preacher I know is a pimp, never should a, a man of God, a woman of God be referred to as a pimp, but how we are treating our followers, looks very pimpish, my godfather said this to me one time uh, when he came to visit. He said, you know what the problem between black preachers and white preachers is? In a white church, you can't tell who the preacher is unless he's in the pulpit. He looks just like his membership. He drives the same kind of cars his membership does. He lives in the same neighborhood his membership. He said, but you see a black preacher? It's chromed out. Now it's, it's chromed out, big wheels. 
The, the, I call them the Jodeci <laughs> suits. They got 25 buttons going down the front. I mean, and you know what I'm talking about. And, and, the, you, and, 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 and you know how the lapels on a regular business suit are the same size, that they're symmetry, they're asymmetrical. They've got the, they've got the, the shoes. They call them the alligator gators where they're ostrich, alligator, and rattlesnake together. And they're these loud colors. And here we are, we got we got the long nails. And I, I'm not making a caricature out of out of us, but here's the thing: more of us look like that. And what happens? We we come here and we take everything from the membership to benefit us. Let me make you laugh. A church here in Charlotte, I know, because I know their members. Their members told me that when they were building a new church, this is what the church told them. Do not pay your, uh, your, your, your mortgage note. Give us what you were paying your mortgage note. And trust God for, for the rest of it. And because of that, not only did they build a new church, but they were giving, this is going to blow your mind, Sister Rembert, $25,000, $30,000 honorariums. That's what you're not going to get. Amen. 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 I have a problem with that. I have a problem with that. Amen. So, no, I'm not expecting. I'm not expecting. I'm not expecting. I'm not saying. But I'm saying, that's what they were giving. Not even for a week's revival, for one Sunday service. And then we want to know why people are right here talking trash about us. Because that's what they see. Yeah, that's right. and, and here's the thing. They may not know the scriptures by heart, but they do have a general understanding that Jesus came to help the poor, help the downtrodden, help the neglected. And what they see, I don't worry, I'm, I'm bringing it to an end. I see you. <laughs> uh, uh, help the downtrodden, help everyone. And then they see these preachers being pimps. Let's pause right here because this, this is so important. We'll pick up next month right here. Uh, let's pause right now. I want to be thankful for the time. Amen. Uh, go ahead, bro. What is the password for the guests in the church? Okay, I, I'll tell us after I cut off the, uh, uh, off the, the right. I don't want to pull up folks in the front yard, <laughs> you know, doing all this stuff. The, uh, amen. We, I'll share that. Uh, are there any prayer requests? Any that we want to raise uh, before we bring this to an end here today? Okay. Then let's do this. Let's close out with a word of prayer. Dear Father God, creator of the heavens and the earth, God, we thank you for this day, for God, this leadership development seminar. God, we pray right now that God, you have spoken to us. You filled our, our spirits with your blessed Holy Spirit, that God, you've edified us and empowered us and encouraged us to go out here and to lead as servant leaders, those who do not mind setting the example, do not mind showing the world what it means to be leaders. God, thank you for those who have sacrificed their time this morning. Thank you for those who are here. God, we pray a special blessing upon them and upon their families, that when they go, God, when they rise, when they fall, when they come, that God, you are always with them in whatever they do. Father God, we pray that you you will always have your spirit in this moment, saturating God and blessing our church, God, so that tomorrow's service is a blessed one, is an awesome one, is a holy one, God, so that, God, you are glorified and someone is edified, so that someone comes in here receiving the answers that they need so they are able to go out and be the disciples and stewards you call them to be. Father God, we pray for those who are sick and shut in. We pray for those who are wrestling with different issues. We pray for those who even may be traveling, God, for traveling mercies. Father God, we thank you and we love you and we honor your holy name. It's in your son's mighty matchless, marvelous, magnificent name we do pray. Amen. 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 Let me